Sea of Galilee. And John, the writer of today's gospel, adds a parenthesis for his readers that they know it as the Sea of Tiberias. And that tells us that John is writing some 50 years after the events that he's talking about. A large crowd kept following Christ, impressed by the signs he had been doing. The Lord and his disciples went up into the high country, <coughs> what today we call the Golan Heights. John tells us that it was the time of Passover. And that's the first indication that John is up to something. John describes three Passovers in his gospel. In chapter 2, at Passover, Christ cleansed the temple and foretold his death. In chapter 13, at Passover, he knew it was his hour to die, and he celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. And here, in the middle of the gospel, is another Passover. And after dropping that little hint, John goes on to describe a miraculous feeding. And if we'd stuck with chapter 6 for five more verses, Christ walking on the water. So, let's take a quiz. What famous Old Testament person miraculously fed people in the wilderness and controlled the power of the sea? Well, that's easy. Charlton Heston, of course. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Moses, that's right, Moses. And what Jewish festival remembered Moses and the parting of the sea and the miraculous feeding in the wilderness? Passover, right again. And that was certainly the connection that the crowds were drawing. Passover was the festival celebrating Jewish freedom. Moses had been the leader who had freed Israel from bondage and oppression. <coughs> and now they were thinking, here maybe was a new Moses and they were kind of hoping he would be the leader who would free them from bondage and oppression. 5,000 men, that could constitute a form of But that was their agenda, not Christ's. Christ's agenda was to give himself as bread for the world. Christ's agenda was the cross. But in this gospel, John has his own agenda too. And Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, does that sound familiar? It ought to, we say it at every divine service. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it. And the word give thanks in Greek is eucharistein. And from that we get our word eucharist, one of the names of the communion liturgy. In John chapter 6, the evangelist connects two big ideas under two signs, bread and water. The whole of chapter 6 
talks about bread and water. John might very well have been thinking of words that Paul had written some 40 years earlier. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same supernatural food, and all drank the same supernatural drink. For they drank from the supernatural rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Even way back then, Paul said, Christ was there baptizing and feeding his people. That's what the first Passover really was, Paul says. And now John tells us that yet another Passover, same thing happened. In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul also wrote, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. <laughs> when do you suppose those people had ever had as much as they wanted of anything? When they were satisfied, again the Greek says, filled full, or full filled, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments that left over, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. Twelve. That's the number of the fullness of the people of God. Today, you and I experience the same thing as we are fed by Christ. And Paul's prayer is answered because we are indeed filled with all the fullness of God. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant <coughs> that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith as you are rooted and grounded in love. And that's exactly what happens in our Eucharistic liturgy. God strengthens us in our inner being by his spirit. Christ lives in our hearts by faith. And we become rooted and grounded in love as Christ draws us into a holy communion with him and with one another. And we are filled with all the fullness of God. Every now and then, over my 50 years of ministry, I will hear from people who profess to find the church's worship boring or disappointing. But then I remember that our Lord was a disappointment to that crowd on the Golan Heights because he did not meet their expectations. Instead of giving them what they wanted, he gave them more. He filled them with all the fullness of God. <coughs> but the fullness of God wasn't what was selling at that moment. What they wanted was political revolution. <coughs> 
C.S. Lewis in his little book, The Screwtape Letters, pictures a senior devil, Screwtape, writing to his young protege, Wormwood, about the proper management of his patient. Wormwood's patient had become a Christian, which was bad news as far as the two devils were concerned. But Screwtape advises the young tempter that all was not necessarily lost. It was still possible to lead the man to damnation. He told Wormwood, and I'm paraphrasing from memory here, if you can't keep the man from going to church, at least get him to shop around for the right one. Whatever you do, don't let him get committed to one church and stay there even if he's not totally happy with it. Rather, send him the rounds of all the local churches, sampling the wares of each, and deciding which of them serves his desires the most. Make him a connoisseur of churches. Our goal, Screwtape says, is to make the man a critic, where the enemy wants him to be a pupil. How blessed we are to be able to gather in this beautiful church with its inspiring appointments. I can remember many years ago worshiping in a small country church in Minnesota. It wasn't in the best shape. It badly needed painting inside and out. The cheap colored glass windows were faded and cracked. The chancel carpet was faded and frayed. The altar hangings had seen better days. And the cheap little electronic organ wheezed. And the organist was a high school girl who had had a couple of years of piano. The pastor was not a gifted speaker or a gifted Bible scholar. And I sat there smugly thinking of my own prosperous and beautiful church and knowing that I could have done that service so much better. And I was tempted to despise the poverty of that worship. But then as the service went on, it began to dawn on me that sitting right there in the presence of God, I was on the verge of committing a colossal sin of pride. In my shame, I looked again and began to see that something beautiful was happening there. Shabby as the surroundings may have been, Christ was there and his presence made that little church glorious. And as I knelt at the altar rail with those humble people and received the Lord's Supper from that humble pastor, I started to pray that the Lord would help me to be as humble as they and as grateful. I came away from that service filled with all the fullness of God. May it always be so for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.